Hi, dear friends, dear students. Welcome to Galland IAS, and welcome to our rapid fire round of Modern India series. In today's session, we will be covering the first five modules of Modern India. That means we are selecting one important topic from each module and solving their most potential questions. Okay, so welcome to rapid fire round series. Here, our first module is decline of Mughal Empire. Decline of Mughal Empire. That was our first module in modern India. So, in this module, there is an important topic which is the third Panipat battle. We come across the third Panipat battle in the first module. So, here, all the historical battles are important from prelims point of view, especially first, second, third Panipat battles. The first Panipat battle which was in 1526. Second is 1556 and third was in 1761. Now here the main players. The 1526 first Panipat battle in which Ibrahim Lodi, the last Sultan of Delhi Sultanate, he was terribly defeated by Babur. Babur was the founder of the Mughal Empire and he established Mughal Empire in India in 1526 yeah, by defeating Ibrahim Lodi and uh, overthrowing Lodi dynasty. The last dynasty to rule Delhi Sultanate was Lodi dynasty and the last ruler Ibrahim Lodi was defeated and Babur established Mughal Empire by his victory in first Panipat battle 1526. Then 1556 this is the second Panipat battle yeah, in which uh, yeah, Bayran Khan on behalf of Akbar defeated the Afghani forces under Hemu. Okay, Afghani forces under Hemu was defeated and uh, Bayran Khan on behalf of Akbar, yes, win this battle, won this battle and Akbar re-established Mughal Empire. That was second Panipat battle. Then 1761, in which Maratha Confederacy was defeated by Ahmad Shah Abdali or Ahmad Shah Durrani. He was an Afghani invader. He invaded India after Nadir Shah's invasion. Nadir Shah was a Persian invader and Afghani. Ahmad Shah Abdali, he was an Afghani invader and he invaded India travel, uh, several times. And uh, third Panipat battle, Marathas, they conquered Punjab and they ousted Timur Shah, the son of Ahmad Shah Abdali. That angered him. He returned and defeated Marathas and that was the third Panipat battle, 1761. Okay, third Panipat battle. Now you answer this question. Third Panipat battle was fought between the major parties involved in the war, that's an important topic for UPSC. Ranjit Singh and Maratha Confederacy, that is wrong. Ranjit Singh even not born, he was born in 1780s, okay. Then Nadir Shah and Mohammad Shah, that is wrong. Nadir Shah, Mohammad Shah war, that was known as Colonel Battle 1739. Nadir Shah, the Persian invader, invaded and he sacked Delhi, okay. And he looted that Kohinoor diamond, the most uh, valuable, precious diamond, okay. So he looted that uh, uh, Kohinoor diamond and Shah Jahan's peacock throne, etc. That was in 1739, Colonel Battle. Then Ahmad Shah Durrani and Maratha Confederacy, that is the yeah, exact parties involved in this uh, third Panipat battle. Mughal Emperor Akbar Hemu, that was the yeah, second Panipat battle. So your answer is C. Moving on to the next module. Yeah, which is subsidiary alliance system. This is a topic we discuss in our second module, which is the rise of the princely states in India. The rise of the princely states or autonomous states in the 18th, 19th century, that is the second module, in which we discuss the subsidiary alliance system also. So, Hyderabad was the first princely state which signed a subsidiary alliance with this British, Nizam Ali and Lord Wellesley. So, this subsidiary alliance system, it was introduced by Lord Wellesley. Then again you take care, what were the major provisions of subsidiary alliance system? A particular princely state which signed this subsidiary alliance system, take care that, that princely state has to accept that British is the paramount power. British is the paramount power and that particular princely state which signed subsidiary alliance, that will be treated as a protected state. That will be treated as a protected state. Again, that particular state has to surrender. It has to surrender 
all their foreign relations with the, or to this British East India Company. They have to surrender their all foreign relations or diplomatic relations, all commercial relations, whatever, they have to surrender to this British. Then British troops will be stationed at the territory of that princely state and that princely state has to pay an annual tribute to British for these particular British troops stationed at his territory. And again, a British resident will be stationed at his headquarters and uh, no other foreign employees other than the British, no foreign employees. That princely state ruler cannot uh, employ the foreigners and also he has to surrender all his foreign relations, that his diplomatic relations and commercial relations with the other Europeans, you know, has to be surrendered to British. Then company also promised that it will not interfere into the internal affair of the state and also it will provide protection from external forces. These were the major provisions of the subsidiary alien system and further we explained, we discussed in our session. Okay, now you answer this question, which one among the following is not correct about subsidiary alliance? Now you take a, a princely state which signed subsidiary alliance system or treaty with the British, they have to accept the paramountcy of the British and also that princely state will be regarded as a protected state of the British. British will be supplying these British troops to his territory and in return princely state has to pay annual tribute to this British. Also princely state has to maintain these troops, they have to surrender their external relations to British, their diplomatic commercial relations, they have to surrender to British. They cannot be in any kind of treaties with the other European powers or other Indian powers, all with the consent of British only. Which one among the following not correct about subsidiary alliance? It compelled to expel all non-English foreigners from the subsidiary state, that is true statement. The subsidiary state had to maintain British troops at its own cost. Subsidiary state had to maintain British troops at its own cost, again true statement. In return, British paid an annual tribute to subsidiary state, that is wrong. It is not the British, it is that particular subsidiary state or that princely state has to pay, had to pay annual tribute to British. A British resident was posted in the subsidiary state, that is also true. So not correct statement is C. Moving on to module 3, the British conquest of India. In this module, we discuss most important major British conquests in India. Anglo-French wars are the Anglo-Maratha, Anglo-Sikh or this Bengal conquest is the, uh, and the conquest of the Sindhis, the Anglo-Burmese war is the Anglo-Afghani war is the. So all these we discuss here. So one of the important topic here is why the French failed in India. French East India Company, British East India Company, First Carnatic War, Second Carnatic War, Third Carnatic War, One Divash Battle, French was terribly defeated. Why French was defeated and why British East India Company was able to establish their sovereignty over India? Yes, British East India Company, you see, British East India Company enjoyed full autonomy. It enjoyed full autonomy. It was established as a private joint stock trading concern. It was given full autonomy, full freedom over decision making. But the French East India Company, that was a dependent company. That depended, that acted as a state department only because, yes, the monarch was the absolute power over the French East India Company's affairs and decision making. British East India Company, it was a joint stock trading concern. It was a joint stock trading concern. Many shareholders invested into this company. At the same time, French East India Company, it was majority shares are bought by this French monarch only. So company has to act according to the wishes of the French monarch. Then this British East India Company had a three strong bases here, Bombay, Madras and to Kolkata. But this uh, French East India Company had a single base that was Pondicherry. According to Marriott, yes, Pondicherry, that was a cardinal blunder of the French. It is not a resourceful region. Then here, British East India Company enjoyed a commercial monopoly where French East India Company has to mobilize all its resources for political ambitions. It has to utilize its profits for this fighting continental wars, etc. Then here, British East India Company had a capable leaders, whereas French East India Company had a single leader that was Jubilees. Then here, British had a very superior navy, but the French had no such a superior navy. These are some reasons why French failed and why British East India Company succeeded here. Now you solve this question. Consider the following statements with regard to French failure in India. 
French East India Company exercised limited autonomy. Exactly, it, it, it was a dependent company on this French monarch, acted as a state department. It had limited discretionary power, limited decision-making power. Every time it has to look up to that French government, it has to get the final permission from the Paris. Okay, So the first statement is correct. French East India Company never allied with Indian rulers. That is wrong statement. They several times allied with Indian rulers. It functioned without consulting home government. That is also wrong statement. It never enjoyed autonomy, full autonomy. It always has to yes, wait for this decision from the Paris, decision from Monarch. Okay. So the reason for French failure here, that is one only. Moving on to the fourth module, which is the socio-religious reform movements and Indian renaissance in 1920 20th century. Brahma Samaj, the founder of Brahma Samaj, yeah, it was Raja Ram Mohan Roy. Raja Ram Mohan Roy, and he is regarded as the fa regarded as the father of Indian renaissance. Then his first establishment, it was Admiya Sabha. It was founded in 1814 to propagate monotheism, single god worship. Then he founded Brahma Sabha, that is in 1828. It was renamed as Brahma Samaj, that was in 1830. Now, what were the major objectives of Brahma Samaj? See, it, it had a social, religious, intellectual reforms. Yeah, religious front, it promoted monotheism, single god worship. Then it opposed to idolatry, it opposed to priesthood, it opposed to complex rituals, and it opposed to polytheism, multi god worship. So it opposed uh, idolatry, it opposed to priesthood, it opposed to rituals, it opposed to polytheism, it advocated monotheism, single god worship. Then social front, it, uh, it, it opposed to sadi, it opposed to child marriage, it opposed to polygamy, then it uh, demanded for better status of widows and it opposed to caste system. It promoted western education and western ideas. Then again, it is said human reasoning is superior than Vedas. That means it is said Vedas are not infallible. Vedas are not infallible. Human reasoning can be applied even into Vedas. Okay. But Dayanand Saraswati believed Vedas are infallible. Which of the following about Brahma Samaj is correct? It advocated Vedas are infallible. That is wrong. Vedas are not infallible. According to Brahma Samaj, Vedas are not infallible. Yes, human reasoning is superior. Human reasoning can be applied into Vedas also. It rejected role of priesthood and politism. That is true statement. Okay, your answer is your answer is two only. Moving on to next uh, module, which is the lower caste movements, civil movements, and tribal movements, etc. In India, so there you study an important topic, which is Vaikam Satyagraha, 1924 to 25. So this was to this was the first to organize to agitation against these discriminations uh, about untouchability. You see, this was for securing freedom of the movement. The public roads leading to Sri Mahadeva Temple at Waikam, it was banned for untouchables. Okay, this is, this is for freedom of the movement and this is an organized agitation against this untouchability. Then KP Keshaman on TK Madhavan, etc., main leaders of this movement, Gandhiji, Chattambi Sami and uh, Sri Narayana Guru, uh, such a great leaders also supported uh, supported these uh, uh, like uh, Vaikam Satyagraha. Then uh, E.V. Ramaswamy Naikar from Tamil Nadu, he participated this Vaikam Satyagraha and got arrested. Then uh, finally, the uh, temple roads were opened for all. Now let's uh, solve this question. Which one of the following is not correct regarding Vaikam Satyagraha? First statement, Gandhiji, Chattambi, Swamigal, Srinarayana Guru supported this movement exactly. Gandhiji, Srinarayana Guru, Chattambi, Swamigal, they supported this uh, Vaikam Satyagraha. Agalis of Punjab organized a strong agitation against this movement. Agalis of Punjab, uh, they never organized a agitation against this movement. Agalis of Punjab supported this movement, supported this movement. Then E.V. Ramaswamy Nayakar, Periyar supported this movement. Vaikam Satyagraha was the first ever organized agitation against untouchability in India, definitely. So here, not correct statement is choice B. Bombay is the Bombay is your answer. Okay. If you find this session is helpful for your preparation, please do subscribe our channel, and your suggestions please mention in the comment section. And a few students asked about our history course fee and further details. Let me tell you our history PCM course. Uh, fee is uh, 15,000, 
but due to these uh, uh, like uh, lockdown and uh, COVID-19 situations, we have a concession over fee and uh, uh, the offer fee will be 12,000 which includes ancient India, medieval India, modern India, art and culture, world history, art and, uh, art and culture of the mains and to modern India of mains plus test series also. History optional fee is 25,000 and to offer 2,000 and to offer fee is uh, 2000 sorry 23000 only or any further detail you can uh, you feel free to contact us okay thank you bye